Hello, everybody, in Zoom and on YouTube live stream. I am Henry Crawford, and welcome to the March 2021 edition of Poets versus the Pandemic. Tonight, we're featuring poets Luther Jett reading from his new book, Everyone Disappears, along with guest poets Sherry Lawrence Flieger and Carolyn Wright. With me tonight is co host and WordWorks founder Karen Allenier. Before we begin, I want to thank the WordWorks and everyone here for coming out and joining us tonight. Okay, so let's get started. First and most importantly, we want you to purchase the poet's book. So I have put in a, a link into the chat that will take you to places where you can purchase the books of each of our poets tonight. And I will do so at other times during the, uh, during the program. We also have a donation button on that page. So don't feel shy about donating to our program. We at the WordWorks and Cafe Muse will thank you wholeheartedly. I will also put into the chat a link where you can follow all of our WordWorks online readings, sign up on the registration form, and you'll be on our mailing list to get Zoom links for all our readings. A couple more things. Please join us on Monday, April 5th, 2021, when Cafe Muse Online will present poets Marguerite Little and Joseph Ross. And we'll be back here again on April 21, 2021. That's a lot of 21s at 7 p.m. EDT with David Keplinger reading from his new book, The World to Come, along with Wayne Miller and Jenny Mulberg. Okay, so now let me introduce Luther Jett. One of my earliest memories of Luther Jett was hearing his strong moral voice at readings back in the Writers' Center. His poems then, as now, gently rattled the room with lyrical yet powerful insights. He's a native Montgomery County, Maryland resident. He's a retired teacher. His poems have been published in numerous journals and anthologies. Most recently, his poem, Monuments, was among the winning poems in the 2021 Moving Words competition. He's the author of three poetry chapbooks with a fourth chapbook, Little Wars, to be published in June, 2021. A poet unafraid to delve into hard questions is a strong poet, a sounding poet, a poet concerned with the paradoxes and mysteries of being human. And I welcome to the PVP stage, Luther Jett. Thank you, Henry. I'm not sure how I can follow that introduction. Uh, I'll do it this way. This is this is my book, uh, and I'm going to only be reading from Everyone Disappears. And so let me uh, let me just dive in. Um, some of these poems are old. Some of them are relatively new. Um, some of them resulted from a very difficult year in my life, and a lot of them didn't. But they're about this kind of thing. That time we were starving. One of us died. I don't remember whether it was you or me, but I'm certain the disappearance tore a hole in the continuum and it doesn't take much now. Fragment of sky, a wall the color of sunflowers, that path between the birches. Miss one meal and all the other hungers rush in. Watch night's fingers grip the naked trees and see how lights flicker on only to fade out again. Yesterday I went all through the house rifling drawers, unsealing boxes, searching for what cannot be found. For what? I have forgotten. holding. Things shatter with the force of holding too long in one place. Ease up on that throttle grasp before you choke. 
the air that day was tuned a crystal pitch and then the smoke paper strips feathered from the sky and on each strip a name inscribed if you pause to count them one by one the dust could swallow everything a word burns when held back as if a searing coal lodged in the throat cast down from unimagined height and might one word atone for everything write this then in your ledger where you keep your darker dreams after the lava cools there is glass obsidian smooth black and keen which gripped too closely cuts and red seeps over everything Days like this, on days like this, gray, slick with rain, smoke rises from the chimneys, fog congeals in the low places, and it is not good to remember other days like this. The trains that leave never return. Today, my brother would have turned 56. He could not breathe any longer. Days like this steal the wind from among the branches. Hunger becomes a stone which lies down and does not get up. Smoke becomes a word for that which cannot be spoken. Fog covers it, a hand pressing down on an open mouth. I could wish another conclusion, but on days like this, everything silvers, monochrome, flat, the smoke, the fog, the faces of people on the streets are hidden. There is no returning, yet we are always looking back over our shoulders. Inhale, exhale, inhale. Dear sister, there is a photograph probably taken around 1954, of me and Daddy out on our front lawn. Dad is cutting the grass with a gas-powered push mower. I remember it was deep green, and I, I am running behind it with a tiny toy lawn mower. Our father, then much younger than either you or I are now. I thought I had a copy, but I can no longer find it. Still, it's locked in my memory. Do you have a copy? Well, why would you? Did it ever really exist? It is snowing here as evening draws down its shade, and I am thinking of that green day long gone. The ground is so cold. It is rapidly turning white as father's hair the last time I saw him. Nightmares my family has gone into town, leaving me with the house to myself, dishes everywhere. 
piles of laundry, books scattered across the floor. I am salvaging trinkets from forgotten fairs. The back door will not stay closed. Something out there wants in. The wind picks up. Snow covers the yard. Trees lose their shapes. The sky gone black. I don't know where I am. The dead return to life. My mother saw them walking on the ceiling, then went up to speak with them. When I was a child in the darkest night hour, the grandfather clock at the foot of the stair would move through our rooms when it thought we were all asleep. From a high window. I'm just reading through these. I don't like to I I I, I want you you the listener to invent your own backstory for most of these. From a high window. My mother is crying in stars from a sky unexpectedly broad murmur. What is all this about? She says, I'm going lots of places. Don't wait supper for me. And from a high window comes the sound of coughing late, late in the carnival night that no one in the gray house can, under, can explain. And I, a world distance, reach the bench only after passing many doors that open onto rooms I cannot know, and in them all, my mother lies weeping until the stars go out. That night, the wind came through. She fell on the stairs, and all the lights went out. I started shaking, trees crashing down. I couldn't stop. Darkness roared outside until they brought me coffee. As the earth trembled, holding that cup of warmth, flickering flashlights grounded me in the silent room. Monitors showed flatline. Nothing afterward the same, nothing afterward the same. Leaves scattered across the lawn, all kinds of papers piling up, small branches, lines down, people stopping by. This went on for days. The telephone kept ringing. All kinds of birds were flying. Mornings were the worst. At some point, realizing I'd lost the shakes, the wind had stopped, the night remained. Coffin. When you are fearful of being forgotten, you become a box that can only hold so much. Understand, the walls are not solid. Water seeps in. Wind blows between the holes in our skin. Our eyes met once. Nothing after has been the same. Recollection Waltz. I remember the feel of flowers, dusky to the touch, their fresh scent in April after the rain. 
and how the bees of summer hovered by the blooming rose, a wing-stirred breeze brushing my cheek. Green-dappled forest, morning breaking over fields. Those were the ways we counted our breaths between the rising and the fall, a long, slow dance. Then the lanterns strung beside the path between the trees floated up to meet the stars. There we could not follow nor speak again the same heart. One by one. First to go was the town library, eaten by fire, each burnt book a world lost. Then the apartments I cohabited with cockroaches, bulldozed to make way for a new city. All the places I once breathed and walked, vanishing one by one. Next, the old high school. Classrooms, book closets, locker rooms, brick by brick, laid to rubble. My parents' home, gutted, made over, and now I cannot bear to drive past. Paper disintegrates, stone wears away. What remains? I chant the names of things long after they have gone, one by one, book, bed, desk, brick, tree, street, mother, father, I'll just read two more, and ultimately, what we could not keep. Summer porches wrapped round shingle-fronted rooms, aroma of strawberries warm from the garden out back. Roadside dust raised on dry days to settle silver among ragged robins, air thick with thunder's promise. Rusted cattle guards, bleach board racks for milk cans, unseen trains slow as they pass through brickyard towns. Cicadas cry. A thousand wings cross the sky at dusk. Toy lost in new moon field. Old dog settled in shade. Fear tinged chill. Sudden bees hum. And I'll close with uh, the eponymous poem from which the uh, title of this book is, is, is taken. But the title of the poem itself is actually Why the Ocean Tastes of Tears. Everyone goes away. Everyone disappears. That should not surprise anyone. It comes with the ticking of clocks in upstairs halls, with the shadows of afternoons that turn golden before fading, and that last star left shining between the midnight west and bomb dark.
dawn. My mother cries at her kitchen sink, and the girl I argued with washes out her paintbrushes in a room I have never seen. Voices fill the air. Small birds go south. The snow melts slowly. Everyone disappears when you most want them to stay. Everyone goes somewhere else, and that is why the ocean tastes of tears. It's the one thing you can count on. When you close your eyes, you dream, and if anyone is still there when you wake, you've witnessed a revolution. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to read to you all. Luther Jett, poet par excellence. Let's give him a Zoom round of applause. And I'll put into the chat, again, those links that will uh, allow you to uh, find the books of these poets. And, um, and it's also got our website on it. So if you want to see what's going on here in the Cafe Muse and in Poets versus the Pandemic, you'll be able to get some of that information. So next up is Sherry Lawrence Flieger. And for me, it's always gratifying to see here on Poets versus the Pandemic, a regular visitor to our Cafe Muse readings back when we were at the Writers' Center and in Friendship Heights. It is also a pleasure for me to highlight the work of a poet who comes from a background in technology, like myself, and who shares, like myself, a love of bicycle riding. Sherry is a three times prize winner at the UK's Rip On Poetry Festival. Her poems have appeared in several literary magazines and in three anthologies of Yorkshire poetry. Her book of Yorkshire sonnets will be launched in Britain in 2021 at the fourth Ripon Poetry Festival. Sherry's poems, like her bike riding, take the most remarkable turns. Joyful surprise awaits us at every line. So let's get ready to take that ride with Sherry Lawrence Flieger. Go for it. Thank you, Henry. Um, as Henry said, um, this book of Yorkshire sonnets, uh, it will be launched in Britain. It's already available here in the US. It started as a single poem and there was so much packed into it that I had to unpack it and it became what's called a heroic crown of sonnets. That's 15 sonnets that are interlinked with each other. So the last line of one sonnet is the first line of the next sonnet for the first 14. And then the 15th is made up of those repeated 14 lines to make the extra sonnet. And I was um, delighted that my friend Janet Klinky would provide photographs for each of the sonnets in the book. And um, she's here tonight listening to me read. She is an associate with distinction in the Royal Photography Society. Um, I'm not going to read all 15 sonnets. I will read just a couple. And if they interest you, you can um, look at the link Henry provided and, and buy the book. And then the rest of my poems tonight will be related in some fashion to the pandemic. So here is sonnet number eight. Fertility has flourished in these hills. Its seeds inspiring life and thought profound. Artistic aspirations reach great heights when beauty, life, and intellect abound. Surroundings such as these can cultivate reflections, observations that instill a reverence for home, for purpose sought, for writing and expression that can thrill. This home of marvel Larkin, Auden, Hughes, and Bennett's plays, and Bronte sisters' prose, suggest that I might find artistic muse engendered in a lovely Yorkshire rose. As I examine what should be my role, 
a Yorkshire calmness overtakes my soul. Sonnet number nine, a Yorkshire calmness overtakes my soul and energy renewed. I breathe my fill of fresh cut hay, of ale, of roses lush, and listen as the lark and wagtail trill. Small lanes infused with memories and blooms, their dry stone walls, mosaics, gray and gold. Define the fields, traverse the splendid hills, a patchwork painting gale and moor and wold. Magnificence surrounds and overwhelms, potentiality is all around. As I hark back my past and plan my life, I feel more comfort with my poet crown. I now know where I'm heading, what I've sought, when I recall each action, word, and thought. So the arc of the, of the book is not just about the different aspects of Yorkshire, but it's also my journey uh, becoming a poet and wondering what the role of poetry will be in my life. So now I'm going to switch to a different poem, not from the book. I think during this pandemic, um, trauma of any kind um, in some ways makes us relive other trauma and makes us remember people we've lost and experiences we've had. So this poem is, um, is a bit of a reminiscence and it's called Smoke. As glowing golden sunbeams poke their noses over the edge of curving earth, wisps of steam slid across the lake's surface, tickling bluegills and smallmouth bass, teasing herons and loons. Smoke floated up and stayed, suspended in puffs like smoke tree tips, like haze rising from the caterpillar's hookah leaving only difficult questions and a wide grin. When we slipped my canoe in the water, dipped our paddles softly, listened as the boat's bottom shushed faintly over Elodia and Nyad, my father inhaled deeply, held that breath. Early riser, energized by Earth's spin, by vibrating light in the softly fading moon, by taking life apart to see what he could learn, his specialty was exuberance. When he read about getting free baseball gloves for smoking small cigars, he switched his two pack a day cigarette habit for plastic tipped cheroots. Smoking enough for one, he ordered a glove for me, the elder daughter. When it arrived, he looked like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, big smile, eager to please, white cigar end tight in clenched teeth. Filling his lungs again, he ordered a second glove for my sister. Then again, for each cousin, for each of the kids on our street, and then one for himself and returned to his unfiltered cigarettes the same kind his father was smoking when he died of a second heart attack at age 52. At 93, wheezing, my father told the nurses how I built my own canoe. He said he was proud of me because I could throw a softball like a man. I have been fortunate to be invited to a small group of musicians, artists, and poets talking about how we use our art to convey not just how we feel during trauma, but how we recover from trauma. So this poem um, tells a little bit about the role of music and writing in my recovery from trauma. It's called, My Mother Used to Say It Doesn't Hurt to Ask. Permission to cry, to remember the before times, during times, trying times, after effects, to cry out at night, to ask to be held, to be encircled in loving limbs. 
permission to be left alone, visited only and always by demons and terrors, scowling, scrabbling ghouls standing on the landing, pushing the door to be let in again. Permission to live with memories, grab and examine them, hold them in my hand, feel their heat, the way they puncture my head, dry my mouth, scar my heart. Permission to write down what happened with shaking hands and shallow breath, to grind muscle memory into sticky lumps of nouns and verbs, then rearrange them on the page, a ransom letter to myself, rewriting the story, especially the ending. Permission to touch, to enjoy dry inquiring fingertips exploring my knobby spine, goosebumped arm, muscled leg. Permission to brush against soft chamois shirts, scratchy fluffy cotton beach towels, especially the Muppets one, redolent of sand and sun with aloof Miss Piggy's smile and feel the smooth static of newly washed nylon knickers. Permission to laugh, to listen to music turned up loud, especially the Pointers sisters jumping for joy, changing the tune, urging me off the edge, onto the landing and down the stairs, boogieing and jiving, alchemically conniving to hotwire every axon and dendrite, to restart, rework, rewrite, and then live in the golden shining promise of survival. So I also have two more. Um, this one is called Shadow Play. And it's about the, the tension between uh, darkness and light in our lives. And it starts with an epigraph from Goethe, which in English translates to uh, where there are deeper shadows, there is much light. In Nantahala Gorge, Cherokee for land of the noonday sun, the river's pulsive table saw slices through harsh stone, leaving jagged craggy walls soaring steeply, tantalizingly close to tickling, caressing, hugging one another, keeping out direct rays almost always. No gentle glints of sunlight teasing us awake, slowly shifting asterisked ebony to dawn, to day. No glimpses of stuttering starlings gathering at dusk to murmurate, to demonstrate collective action. No matutinal thunderheads threatening disruption or promising welcoming downpour. Thick towering boles, Nantahala's old growth trees throw shadows even at midday, even midwinter, when buds and leaves are memories and earth shudders with frost and lost promise. When icy churning rapids hurl slick spray and whirlpools tap dance, grinding fallen stones to silt. No darksome devouring, shadow protects us with covering wings, contours and down shading the gloom, wiry plumage hiding chuck holes and wrong turns, masking missteps, scarred bark and narrow twisted pathways long traversed and abandoned not Stygian foreboding nor absence. Shadow craves brightness, is defined by it, its spindly filaments flagging, catching on the past, reminding us what we've learned as we step out into the light. And then the final poem I wrote because I was thinking about how the next generation will address trauma, not just um, the kind of health trauma that we've been experiencing, but all sorts of trauma, economic, social, um, all sorts of disruption. 
It's called cataract and it's, um, it reflects the two different derivations of the word cataract. It has Greek roots and Latin roots. And one derivation is about um, covering things. So the cataracts in your eye, the other is about waterfalls. And it's a sestina. So you will hear the same six words repeated. Patterns and patter slowly. Waning fall wraps me in ages banes. Shadowing eye, unsteady hand. But dark and speckled sun unclouds inner thoughts. Pulses intense beams, igniting internal grit. Rapid race toward insight, toward sense making. Eyes water as I strain for understanding. Water as I squint at truth. Brittle blinders fall as focus turns to life's larger ills, race, poverty, unfairness, and what role I might play in rotating a spotlight's beam on injustice. Amber ribbons of sun warm, soften options. Bathing my grandson in morning's glow, I soothe bubbled water on his velvet black body Watch him beam at rubber toys, splash his private pond, fall into fluffy towel dry ecstasy, eye the room, his plaything universe, and race to cuddle, grasp, embrace it all. Will race avert his gaze, obscure his rising sun? Or will he swell, look scorn in the eye, a chestnut wave of urgent surging water? cascading beyond stumble stones, or fall portcullis-like, thrusting iron-braced beams, confronting hate. He'll balance on the beam that runs from where we are to what we race to be. Like Zambezi's Victoria Falls, he is smoke that thunders, spraying the sun with his laugh and look, the boiling water forcing change, freeing, unjaundicing eye. Sable, sturdy, in the blink of an eye, he will grow oak tall, steel strong, mast and beam, virtuous vessel on unkind water. Sparkling obsidian, saluting race and heritage, he will watch dusky sun set on my world, choke outrage with nightfall. With unclouded eye, Clear head, he will race, inner light beaming, passion driven sun. His hope royals waters, barriers will fall. Thank you. A truly masterful uh, reading, Sherry Lawrence Flieger. Thank you so much. And I will put into the chat again, for people who have come in, the links that will take you so that you can purchase the books of these poets and also visit our website uh, for Cafe Muse readings in the future. So those are in there. And now um, we have uh, quite a crowd here tonight yeah. of over 80 people. And we also have a worldwide crowd with people uh, stretching as far as we know we have Great Britain and possibly New Zealand, which would be the other side of the world. So uh, we have quite a crowd here. And now coming to us from the Pacific Northwest is <laughs> Carolyn Wright, a gifted poet whose latest book is This Dream, The World, New and Selected Poems. The title poem of that work received a Pushcart Prize and was included in The Best American Poetry. Carolyn is the author of nine previous books and chapbooks of poetry, along with several books of translations and one of essays. Her poems reveal a searching and curious mind, one that is at home with various forms and subjects. And like all of our poems, poets tonight, there is a strong moral force that underlies her writing. So without more, let's welcome Carolyn Wright, to poets versus the pandemic. Go for it, Carolyn. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, audience worldwide and uh, in various on various platforms. And thank you, Henry and Karen, for inviting me. 
and for L Luther and Sherry for your powerful readings. And so I am honored to be here. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm, actually the three poems I sent to you, Henry, I think I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read at least two of them. Uh, the first is the title poem of my first book. So it's, a, it's an earlier poem. Uh, it is just called Stealing the Children After a Big Wind in Wyoming. And you know, we've had a lot of big wind storms recently. So, so think of that. It's not the kind of country where you can walk dry eyed. An olive green wind blows dust up and down the alleys, gathers dry leaves in its fists for storm. It's the kind of town where if you leave your children unattended, the wind drives up for them in its long black station wagon. They go so willingly, they leave their tricycles scattered over three backyards. Later, you roam the feedlots, poking among freight rails that writhed like wounded serpents while the twister passed over. Your own mind is blown so dry, it can't recall who they were. Those who left in mid-gale, clambering into the front seat of the wind, not even waving goodbye as they blew down the street, leaving only scraps of their voices like strewn toys on your lawn. So that was uh, one of the ones I suggested. Uh, I'm going to go to Brazil now, uh, to the city of Salvador, which is the capital city of the state of Bahia. And there's an amazing church there called Nosso Senhor de Bom Fim, uh, our Lord of good ends, basically, you know, Bom Fim would be death, uh, a, good, a good death. Uh, but it is a church known for miracles. Uh, and when you visit there, there are off the high altar, there are several rooms full of uh, items that are attestations of miracles that have been worked to heal people. Uh, and so I went there and I looked around and I, I was waiting for a miracle, but there was a, there were a lot of tourists there at the time. So uh, I finally saw this miracle. The Miracle Room, Nosso Senhor do Bom Fim, São Salvador da Bahia. The Kodaks focus on the ceiling, a Baroque reliquary, doll factory of arms and legs. Facsimiles, the grateful make of ghost limbs raised from the dead. Silver medals from the mouths of infants who weren't supposed to live before and after photos, testimonies scotch taped for years to the wall. The home movie makers check their light meters and wonder what's held up the tour bus. They don't notice the little girl who comes in through the side door without a face. They don't see her cross herself dip her fingers in holy water with coupons from the Bahia Hilton floating on its surface. No one notices her slide along the wall, finding her way with the help of plaster hands that catch hold of hers. The charter group doesn't know she's lighting a candle, kneeling before our Lord of facelessness, our Lord of Bon Fin. They can't see the black Madonnas in their sea froth lace, nod from the altars, raise carved hands in blessing. Not even the cook's tour guide reciting from the souvenir brochures glances over to see her rise, blink, sneeze once, press fingers to the deep rows of her mouth and skip out the chapel door, swinging a mask from which the features have been erased. 
So that was that was the miracle that I saw. So let's see. The next, I will go to uh, a poem in the new part of the this new and selected. Uh, this was actually uh, took place years ago when I was a child. It was a visit to uh, the state school in uh, in Buckley, Washington, the Rainier State School. And we were going to visit my older sister, a sister I did not know I had. So here is that poem. Mommy, I whimper. She won't talk to me. I tug at my mother's skirt. Why won't she talk to me? I am four. My mother crouches next to me, so she's at my eye level. Smell of perfume and cigarette smoke in her hair. Not far away, the tall girl with curly dark gold hair, whom the ladies in white dresses brought and stood before me. This is your sister, they said, and left her there in front of me. My sister shook her curly hair and stood there. I didn't know I had a sister. What's your name? I asked. Do you want to play? But my sister just stood there, rolling her eyes, rolling her curly head from one shoulder to the next, till I got scared and ran back to my mother, who stood smoking and talking with the ladies in white dresses. Mommy, she won't talk to me, I tugged my mother's skirt. Why won't she talk to me? My mother crouches beside me, perfume and cigarette smoke in her dark gold hair and a hollow look on her face. I don't yet know the word stricken. You see, dear, my mother puts her arm around me. She can't talk. She can't talk, I ask. She's not able to talk. Oh, how strange, I think, as the ladies in white dresses lead away the girl they've called my sister. My mother stands up and takes my hand. Together, we gaze into the vast day room full of blurred, wobbly children, making vague word-like sounds and playing in slow motion. So much like, unlike the children in the playroom for shoppers' children at the Bon Marche downtown. She can't talk. And I can't know it will be years before my mother mentions my sister again. And that poem, uh, there's a whole series of poems called The Mute Sister Sequence in this new and selected. So um, that was a wonderful opportunity to be able to um, write that sequence. Uh, well, we've had a lot of tragedy recently, and uh, you know, in in the realm of um, violence, gun violence, and uh, one of those incidents has been much mentioned, you know, in the news, in the public forums in the last couple of days, and that's the Sandy Hook shooting at Newtown, Connecticut, which took place on December fourteenth, twenty twelve. Um, I of course was aware of that at the time. It was it was just horrific. Um, a few days later, President Obama, who was of course president at the time, was at a memorial service for the children, and he recited the names of all the children. Uh, and I was I wrote all that down. I was I was just I wrote those names down in the order in which he recited them. Uh, and But what started this poem for me was an interview that was given by the father of one of the children. His name was Dr. Robbie Parker. Uh, he was a medical doctor and he was being interviewed and he was telling the interviewer that on the day of this terrible event, he had been speaking Portuguese 
with his daughter. Now, you know, he was sort of blonde and blue eyed and he, he didn't look like, you know, a person who would be like a native Portuguese speaker, although you never know, but he was teaching her to speak Portuguese. And I was fascinated by that because Portuguese, of course, is the language that I love the most. Uh, and I found that that line got me going. And this is a guzzle for Emily Parker. And you'll hear the repetition of the guzzle form. He had been teaching her to speak Portuguese so their last words together were in Portuguese. Such simple words that morning. Thank you, please. I love you, daddy. All in Portuguese. Then he rode off to work past winter trees and she to school smiling to herself in Portuguese. She fell with her classmates, the other girls and boys, folding into herself like snow. No tongue, no Portuguese, no hearts that walk outside their lives in fields that winter can't amend. No Portuguese can call them back, unspeak their parents' grief in English, Spanish, Chinese, Hebrew, Portuguese. Oh, Charlotte. Daniel, Olivia, Josephine, Anna, Dylan, Madeline, Catherine, Chase, Jesse, James, Emily, Jack, Noah, Caroline, Jessica, Benjamin, Aviel, Allison, Grace. So that was, uh, that was what you know, I was moved to write at that time. Uh, I have a couple minutes left. I'm going to go to yet another, another country. Um, I was not in Chile during the military uh, very junta that ruled the country, the, the dictatorship that ruled the country after the military coup that took place in September of 1973, which was the first 9-11. But uh, my friend and poet, Eugenia Toledo, who is from Chile, uh, and here is her book, Sorry for the Glare on the cover. It is called, uh, it is called um, Map Traces, Blood Traces, and it's a bilingual volume. I'm just gonna read the English poem. Uh, it is called Streets of Uncertainty. And this was an experience she was having in Chile, in Santiago uh, in 1985. And it's based on an actual incident. One morning walking through Santiago on my way to work, the city already awake to traffic and crowds, I passed by a patrol van of carabineros. They had a young man in handcuffs whom they mistreating right there on the street, punching him and pressing his face against the car window. People watching, nobody said a word. I approached and said, please, can't you see he's a child? What has he done? The officer turned to me and putting his face close to mine replied, Stay out of this lady. He's a fucking Marxist. You want us to take you too? I was afraid. So I walked on to my office, wondering even to this day what he had done that was so wrong and he's so young and even more, what it was we all did that allowed this to happen. So that is uh, a bit of Chile back in the day. Uh, it has improved somewhat there, but uh, it could always be better. And I'm going to conclude with a poem uh, to lighten the mood a little bit. You may know that today, and I just heard this on the radio today, today is Equal Pay Day, the day in which, on average, women have made enough money in 15 or so months in order to make what on average men, especially white men, made in the 12 months of 2020. So 
I'm not going to read from Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace, because as the lead editor, I did not put any of my own work in that anthology. But I will conclude with a poem that is not on my resume, which is a work, a poem about work that an experience that happened to me. Not on my resume. I quit. I meant to tell the manager, Lurleen, as soon as I ducked into Pizza Haven that Friday afternoon to collect my final paycheck. A day off from my first crummy job at 17. Tail between my two thick legs, I slunk into the air conditioned cigarette smoke chill, skin damp cheese and pepperoni, a greasy feasty haze. Pizza hell, I called the place. I was almost ashamed to show up. I was such a lousy waitress, mixing up orders, begging smoker co-workers to empty the ashtrays from my tables, smoothing unused napkins and pushing them back into the spring-loaded metal dispensers. I slowed, slowed, slowed the whole operation. Even then, a reduce, reuse, recycle fiend before the slogan had ever been invented. Lurleen met me in the aisle between tables whose oil cloth covers I never could wipe clean. She straddled the passageway and growled, you're fired. Her bulldog jaw worked as if a wad of chaw had found its rhythm and was perfecting its moves in her mouth. Get your paycheck and clear out. She blocked my way to the kitchen, her eyes drilling me with a roomy blue precision. I, 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 I stammered as I had when frat jock slapped my derriere and each other's backs, then stubbed out their Marlboros in uneaten slices of perfectly good pizza I could have wrapped up and taken home on the sly. It would only have been thrown away as I'd stammered when Dirk, the afternoon cashier, had caught me at the end of my shift, sliding uneaten slices wrapped in wax paper into my handbag. You can't fire me, I quit, I finally blurted, but Lurleen had already stumped back to the server station to stack the plastic garlic bread baskets and yell at the new girl to wipe down the red and white tablecloths, almost as checkered as my resume in all the decades since that day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carolyn Wright, a world-class poet for our world-class for our worldwide audience. So uh, I will uh, put the, uh, I'll put that link again there to, uh, to find their books and to find our website uh, into the chat. And it looks like we're coming up against the witching hour here. Uh, so in closing, I would like, uh, I'd like you all to, uh, to know that I've enjoyed this evening's readers. I hope you have. And I will extend, and I hope you extend your enjoyment to purchasing their books and letting others know about our series. And so I have put that link into the chat. Please come back on April 5, 2021, when Cafe Muse Online will be featuring poets Marguerite Little and Joseph Ross. And we'll be back here again with PVP on April 21, 2021, with David Keplinger reading from his new book, the World to Come, along with Wayne Miller and Jenny Mulberg. Mm -hmm. So it has been quite a night. And um, as I say at the end of all of these shows, good night and stay safe. <laughs>